Jesus, uh, what a terrible thing to have a hard heart. And yet, Lord, I'm speaking to some tonight that are hard, some that are in the process of hardening. And yet there are some, Lord, that have open, tender hearts, and, and yet one day we'll have this hard heart that we're talking about and warning about tonight. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to come down upon me mightily. I'm asking you to, to give me clean hands and a pure heart. I want to deliver your heart. I want to deliver your mind. Speak into me and through me. And let everybody in this place uh, be warned, be touched. Oh God, I don't want a hard heart. I, I want to stand before you one day with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Don't let us ever lose that, oh God. As we see the making of this hard heart, may we be warned. And oh God, for those whose hearts are in the process of hardening, melt their hearts tonight. Don't let anybody walk out of here with a hard heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The making of a hard heart. There's nothing in my mind as beautiful and as wonderful as an open, receptive heart. I love to be around people that have openness, that they just receptive to the Word of God. But there's nothing in my mind as sad, as sad as a hard-hearted person. What a tragedy to be around somebody whose heart is like a stone. It's rock hard. <clears throat> now, some are hearing me right now that are developing this hard, unreachable heart. There are some in the balcony here on the main floor. You're almost at the point of being unreachable. And we'll explain that in just a bit. But how does a person, how, how does anybody, especially a backslidden Christian, develop a hard heart? Now, you can forget all about the psychologists and their pop psychology about why people get hard against religion. Because they say there's so many hypocrites, all kinds of excuses why people... See, uh, psychologists always blame somebody for your problem. And you can find somebody to blame. And uh, yet the Bible makes it very clear, very clear how the heart gets hard. I want you to go to Mark, the sixth chapter. And I'm going to show you a man who best exemplifies a man who had an open heart and closed it and became hard-hearted. A terrible, terrible tragedy. Mark, the sixth chapter. Let's begin reading at verse 7. I want to read this whole portion so that we can set a background. How a man or a woman develops a hard heart. It's all in this that I'm going to be reading to you and we'll go through it. Mark 6, beginning to read verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for the journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil, many that were sick and healed them. Now listen to this, please. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said... Now, folks, this is Resurrection Day, that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. He believed in the resurrection. And therefore, mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said, this is Elias. And others said that it's a prophet or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, it's John, whom I beheaded, he's risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John, bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It's not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. All right, look this way, please. There was a tremendous commotion out in the Judean wilderness. Out by the Jordan River, multitudes from Jerusalem and all over Judea were going out to hear a very strange-looking man. 
This man had been living in the desert, and you you could be sure he had not shaven. He had long hair. He had a beard. He had a coat of camel's hair. He had a leather girdle on him. And when they offered him food, their food from the city, when he offered them their sweet breads and their desserts, he turned it down, and he turned aside and had his own little meal of locust. He ate locust and wild honey. He ate bugs. Strange man, according to the crowd. But they were flocking out to hear a man sent from God, a man who called himself only a voice, and that voice was the most piercing voice that had ever appeared on the scene in Judea or in on the earth at that time. And they were flocking out. They loved to hear him scathe the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He came out, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they would stand in the periphery of the crowd and he'd point his rod at them and call them a brood of snakes, a brood of vipers. He said, just a pack of snakes. And the crowd loved it. But they repented because his message pierced into their hearts. Soldiers came to hear him. And and they would say, what can we do to be saved? Because his message pierced their hearts. And he said, "Uh, be satisfied with your wages. And I'm sure King Herod loved to hear him preach to his army, be satisfied with your wages. He He was scathing to all against sin. He was fearless. He feared no man. And Herod heard about this man, John. And I'm, I'm sure, being the leader, being the king, he traveled with quite an entourage. I would always picture, uh, I've always pictured that scene. I've got a vivid imagination. I picture about six black chariots. And, and I see horsemen everywhere, his bodyguards, and I see them coming, standing. Uh, he parks his, his uh, chariots on the hillside. He's heard about this man. Now, I, I have a feeling in my heart that Herod had grown cynical. He, he had administered uh, government to the Jews, and I'm sure he was tired of the phony priest he, uh, of that day. He was tired of the Pharisees who made long prayers and yet robbed widows' houses. He saw the hypocrisy. He, he heard their crazy messages. He saw infighting among the different religious sects and I'm sure he was cynical. He was saying, religion has nothing to do for me. And he he went out of curiosity. Because uh, that's where many of you are here right now. Many of you have heard a cynical, you're cynical in, in a measure because you've heard and seen nothing in religion, but that which is hypocrisy. You have judged all religion by certain television ministries that are into materialism or preach a money gospel, and you've called them money grubbers. Some of you sitting here now, you have never really seen reality. You've never heard it. All you've seen of religion is that which has bored you and caused you to be cynical. But he came out of curiosity to hear this prophet John. And I'm telling you, when he heard him, something happened in Herod's heart. He said, this is a different man. He is a holy man. He's a godly man. This man is telling the truth. This man, the Bible said he gladly heard him. And he did many things. He kept coming back to hear John. And the harder John preached, the more he loved it. In fact, one day, he came to hear John the Baptist. And he's sitting there. I don't know if Herodias is there or not. But he had stolen his brother Philip's wife. And he's living in adultery. And in that society among the Jews, that's the worst thing he could have done. Unforgivable sin. And John the Baptist points a finger at him right at the king. And he says, King Herod, it's not lawful for you to have that woman. Give her up and do what is right. Repent. And Herod loved it. He loved it. I can picture him going back and telling his prime ministers and and his cohorts, There's a man of God. That's what I like to hear. I like to hear a man tell it right. That man's not into materialism. That man doesn't care about clothes. That man's a real preacher. We're going back. You know, a lot of people like that. They they finally hear a sound. And they know it's not phony. And they know the man or the men that preach it are living it. Because men who 
live their message, you can't mistake it if you have discernment in your heart. You can't mistake it. And he hears a sound. And he loves that straight preaching. And he loves this man. In fact, the Bible said he defended him. He, he would let nobody touch this man. That's my man. That's my preacher. I'm sure he went up and down the halls of his palace saying, tomorrow we're going down the wilderness again. I've got to hear another heart message from Brother John. And I'm sure he told everybody. I'm sure he got up before his court and said, I want everybody there tomorrow. You've got to hear this man. He is something else. He tells it like it should be. That's the way preachers should be. That's the way churches should be. Like John the Baptist. He comes to hear John the Baptist, and the Bible said he hears him gladly. I'm going to tell you, folks, I'm preaching tonight the same message John the Baptist preaches. We preach repentance. And I'm going to preach it straight. And we preach straight from this pulpit. You know, we have a lot of people that come to this church, and they sit here. They've, they've heard all kinds of phony stuff. They've come from churches that have bored them. And they come and they say, boy, they tell it straight. I like it. I've had them hug me and say, boy, you preach it straight, Brother Dave. Don't stop preaching it straight. And I know they're still living like the devil. I've been comp, I have been complimented. More on my preaching by sinners than Christians. You know, I'm not looking for your compliments, by the way. And I'll tell you what, the more I preach straight, the less it'll be complimented. But he, he is so taken by this man. He makes moral changes in his life. He does a lot of changes. He goes home and he thinks it over and he says, I, I can't do that anymore. I can't do that anymore. He's laying down this and he's laying down that. He hears him and he makes moral changes in his life. Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and he observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and he heard him gladly. Gladly he heard him. Well, there are some of you here tonight, you don't have a hard heart. You gladly hear the word because there's a hunger. This man had a hunger in his heart. He couldn't have come unless there was something in him that really wanted reality. This is the tragedy. This is where hard-heartedness starts. With many people who start with a hungry heart, they really want reality. They really want to do what is right. They don't want to, they don't want to live in their sin. They don't want the misery anymore. They want, they really want to change. And I believe Herod wanted to change. But you see, Herod could not give up a fatal attraction in his heart. He, he was totally ensnared by this woman Herodias. He had stolen his brother Philip's wife. He is an adulterer. He's living in adultery. And John said, you can't repent until you bring forth uh, works meet to repentance. In other words, you've got to do what God says. You've got to do right. You've got to lay your sin down. And he, he is convicted by this message. And uh, Herod knows this woman. He knows she's a murderess. She's a conniving, revengeful woman. And he knows it. There's no way he can get around the, this manipulating, conniving, murderous woman. No doubt she's intelligent. She may have been beautiful. She may have been charming. But she was a snake. And, John, and Herod knew it. All around Herod, John, uh, uh, he sees men repenting at John's message. He sees people changing. He sees uh, people making restitution. He sees soldiers no longer complaining. He sees Pharisees. He sees publicans paying back over uh, 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 collected taxes. He sees people that have stolen things making restitution. And here he is. He's being challenged now. If you want to repent, if you want life, lay down your besetting sin. Lay down your pet idol. Lay it down. But Herod really would have loved to repent if he could have given up everything but Herodias. John, 
there's no evidence that he ever went to John alone and said, look, John, I respect you. I know you're a holy man, and I've got a problem. I am hooked on this woman. I hear your message, and I would really like to be free. Could you tell me how to get free? You see, there are people sitting here right now You would love to repent. You would love to serve Jesus and come to this church even perhaps faithfully. You'd like to be a part of the body of Christ. But there came a time, and there's a time just now about to ripen for you, where the Holy Ghost says, if you're going to repent, you've got to lay down that besetting sin. You've got to lay down that fatal attraction. You've got to lay it down now, tonight. And Herod, there's no evidence that he went to John. John could have told him, why, there's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not even worthy of latch, and he is coming to open every prison door. He is coming to break every chain. And if you'll repent, he's already here in spirit, and he will give you, he, he will give you freedom. He will break it. There could have been a break. He could have been helped. Some of you sitting here now, You can't come to Jesus because of a fatal attraction in your heart. Now, what is it or who is it that's holding you back from repenting and following Jesus with all your heart? I've got to speak what I believe the Holy Ghost has put on my heart tonight. There are some of you, a number of you here tonight. You have backslidden over this. You are not serving God because of it. Let's talk first to young women Middle-aged women, I don't know what age you may be. Let's talk to the ladies first. You cannot make a surrender. You cannot repent because you have a heart that's given over to somebody. There's a man in your life, and that man is evil. That man is corrupt. That man is going to destroy you. And deep in your heart, you know what he's like. You know it in your heart. And the Holy Ghost has dealt with you. You know that that man, you do things and say things with him that you wouldn't do under any other circumstances. You do it and say it only when you're with him. You know there's something evil. You know there's a serpent in it. But it has your heart and you can't lay it down. There are men here right now. There's some woman in your life that has captured your soul and your mind. And you can't eat, you can't sleep, it's consuming you. You want Jesus, you don't want to go to hell. You'd like to be a Christian, you'd like to repent, but you can't stay away from that serpent woman. She has your heart. She makes you say and do things you would not think of doing at one time. It's there, it has your heart. That's the beginning of a hard heart. Herod turns away from John's preaching because he knows if he repents, he's got to lay it down. Now, let me tell you something and listen closely. The Lord, by his spirit, is is not wanting you to lay down your adultery, your, your drugs, your alcohol, these besetting sins, simply because he's mad at you for doing them. It's, it's not because your sin angers. He's already paid the price for sin. He died for all sin. The reason he wants you to lay it down is because he knows the snake in it. He knows the viper in it. He knows the poison in it. He knows it will kill you. He knows it will destroy you. It's because he loves you. Then he said, lay it down or it'll kill you. It'll give you a hard heart and you'll turn against me. It's not, it's not just Adultery. It's not fornication. It's not. It's the fact that it has your heart. It's an idol. And it has you in its grip. It's ensnared you. And he goes back. The Bible said, a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Shall be destroyed. John could have helped this man. You know, if you'll come to Jesus... With your fatal attraction. If you come to Jesus with that, that, that bosom sin that holds you so tight. If you'll come bold, you just come as a child to Jesus. You say, oh Jesus, this has overwhelmed me. This has overpowered me and I've got to have help. 
You come with an open heart. You come ready to lay your sin down, even though it's got a hold of you. You come to him, and I promise you the Holy Spirit will lead you through. It may take a little time, but God will bring you through. He'll break every chain. He will break those chains. He has all the power. You say, if I come to Jesus, I've tried. I've made promises, and I can't break it. I keep going back. Because you have not yet trusted the Holy Spirit. You have not yet understood how much he wants to deliver you. There is deliverance. Hallelujah. You have to have the want to. You have to have the desire. So, God, I want to be free. I promise you, you can be free. There is not a sin. There is not a sin out of hell that can't be broken. There is not a single fatal attraction that cannot be smashed by the power of God through the Holy Ghost. If we, by His Spirit, mortify the flesh, we shall live. Through His Spirit, we kill the flesh. The trouble is, you've been fighting it yourself and making promises, and what you wind up is sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess. And it doesn't work, and you get discouraged, and you go out and say, what's the use? I don't want, watch what happens now when, when, when you go to your idol, because if you go to your idol, you become just like it. Whatever spirits in the idol will leap upon you. And I want to show you those, those who go back to their lust or their fatal attraction are soon driven into a deep, wicked, destructive, downward spiral. You Listen to me, please. You've got to hear this. It's not a matter of saying, well, I'm just going to go my way. I'm just going to do my little thing. I've, I've got one thing I can't let go. And I'm, I'm just, someday I'll be free. But you see, the devil never going to be satisfied to let you just go out and do your thing with your one little particular sin. He's not going to be satisfied at all because he's going to make sure that he drives you down deeper and deeper into sin so that you will never want to come back. He has to harden your heart lest you once again gladly receive him like Herod did. He has to take that gladness toward the gospel out of your heart. And the only way he can do that is to drive you deeper and deeper into wickedness, filth, and vileness. He will drive you. And folks, I have seen that all the years of my preaching. Those who've sat under the gospel of repentance like Herod and then turns away, goes to the idol, goes to the attraction, says, well, I, I, I just can't give this up. Well, go follow the attraction. Go follow the lust. And folks, what a terrible thing begins to happen to this man now. He begins to close the gospel off. You don't find him anymore going out to hear John preach. You find him now becoming more and more like his idol. He becomes more and more like Herodias. And he's being driven. And it's not very long. Folks, it's just a very short time. A very short time. Just a matter of months before this man loses all his senses. And finally, for a song and a dance... A song and a dance, this man sells out a godly man, kills him and decapitates his head. Takes his head off. You watch this man hardening his heart now. He's driven to do something he never thought he would ever do as long as he lived. It's so uncivilized. It's so vile. It's so unthinkable that he could lose all his reason and act like an animal and sell out this man that he knew to be a man of God, so holy and so righteous, and and chop off his head and sit there at a party and watch them bring the head of John the Baptist in on a tray. He presented to Herodias. And I believe that woman was wicked enough to have that head bronzed and put in her bedroom on her dresser. Such a wicked, vile woman. You 
You say, preacher, I'm Pastor Wilson. I'm, I'm not a preacher killer. I, I am not going down into degradation. I may have a problem, but I may have a besetting sin, but I'm never going to go down into that spiral, go worse and worse. Oh, that's not what Romans says. Romans, the first chapter. You'll see this spiral of sin that goes down to the very pits of hell. First chapter of Romans. I'm just going to read a few verses, 18 and 19. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is shown to them or manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, you see, they, they heard the preaching. They knew what was right and wrong. They glorified him not as God. In other words, they stayed to their idols. Neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now I want you to go down at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now let, look at me for just a minute. A reprobate mind is, is a mind that is no longer open. It's a closed mind. It's absolutely closed. And when the mind is closed to the gospel, that which could be known of God was clearly known, but they refused to retain it. They refused to heed the gospel. Therefore, God gave them over to a closed mind. And now look what's happening. We look at this spiral down into hell, doing those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Folks, that's, that's, these sins are pasted right on the gate of hell. These are sins right out of hell. It, it, it's, these are steps leading right to the pit. And the worst of all, verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Oh, here's what happened to Herod. Herod now is doing exactly what Herodias was doing and having pleasure in it. He was just like his idol. He had become the idol. No, oh, folks, the day will come when, when right now you, you walk out the streets here and you see some of the stuff that goes on. You go in the subway, you go on the job, you walk some of these filthy streets of immorality and you see what some people are capable of. You read about it, you hear about it. And, and at one time you would have scratched your head and said, how can anybody do that? And then in short time, you're doing exactly everything you've heard of, every sin that's named you are going to be guilty of it because you have now a closed mind and you're following after your lust. You have been given over to your idolatry till finally you not only do what they're doing, but you enjoy seeing others do the same thing. You take pleasure in that kind of wickedness where once you could have walked into a bar room and run out because the Holy Ghost was pulling you. Now you go in, you're one of them, you're a part of it. Now those secret things that you only once dreaded and said, how can any human being do it? And then suddenly you're doing it and having pleasure with others who do the same things. That's all that he's talking about here. But a tragedy. Tragedy. You may not believe it. And it won't be long till you'll be capable of the most unthinkable sins. Who would have ever thought that a man who sat there praising this man, obeying this man, glad to receive him, would turn aside one day and said, chop his head, and walk away and become like Romans 1. Who would have ever believed it? It's the hardening process. Who would have ever believed uh, a preacher's wife, three precious children, who one time would rather die than give up one of her children, but she falls into an adulterous affair, falls in love with a young man half her age, runs off, leaves her kids, 
Her heart's hard. She never, if you'd have told her five years before, one day you're going to run off, leave all your children, leave the ministry, and you're going to wind up drinking and going to bars, she would have laughed at you. But no, downward spiral. She cut off everything and turned to her idol. Who would have ever thought a young woman could uh, drive her car into a lake because she's in love with a young man who says he doesn't want anything to do with kids. And she's got two. What happens to a woman? What kind of a downward spiral brought her to this place where she can just sit on the edge of the lake and watch as her car slowly sinks and her two boys screaming and drowning? What kind of a downward spiral? What kind of hardness happens? What kind of hardness? And you know, they tell us that that young woman at one time played with those children. They were so sweet and she seemed to love them so much. An idol. She became just like her idol. Hardness set in. Anything goes when that hardness comes. Anything. Now those who come to this point become haunted. Haunted. Absolutely haunted. There's nobody more haunted than a backslider. I mean, they're the most haunted people in the world. Every time they can walk down the street, they hear a trumpet. They come to, you know, the trumpet of the Lord is sounded. They come to attention. There's, a, there's another rumor that comes to Herod. said, there's, a, there's another man. And he's... He's raising the dead. Lepers are being healed. Blind eyes open. Deaf ears unstopped. He said, I know who he is. I know exactly who he is. Well, his name is Jesus. No, it's not Jesus. It's John. He's raised from the dead. He's come to hunt me. And his, his friends and his cohorts said, no, no, it's, it's Elias prophet. It's Elijah raised from the dead. Or one of the prophets or someone like a prophet. They're trying to quiet him down. He said, I don't care who you said it is. It's John. Man can't sleep. He can't eat. He's haunted. He's, he knows he's turned down the gospel of repentance. He knows he's killed a holy man of God. And I'll tell you, every time you walk out on a Holy Ghost message, you crucify Jesus afresh. But it's Elijah, Herod. No, it's John. And I'll tell you, from that time on, all through Jesus' ministry, he is wanting to meet this man. Now, you know that Pilate finally brought him to him and he had a face-and-face encounter. This man believes in resurrection. Here's a man who believes in miracles. He still has this. I, I, I believe in miracles because later he's going to ask Jesus to perform a miracle for him. When he has him face to face. And, and he keeps believing that a holy man can be raised from the dead. He believes in resurrection power. Isn't that amazing that people can live in the depths of sin when they backslide? They can still believe. There are, there are some of you here now, you have turned your back on the Lord. You're deep in your sin. You're going downhill, doing things now you never thought you could ever do. But, but if anybody dare ask you, you can be in a bar, you can be drunk and still talk about Jesus dying on the cross. You know all about it. You still believe that Jesus died for sin, that he is resurrected from the dead. That he was a man who could heal. You know all about him. You could probably teach in a Bible college for two hours. How do you sleep? You you know, every time, the New York Times, the past two weeks, been talking about everybody in the country talking about angels appearing everywhere. Life Magazine, the front page, angels appearing. They're talking about angels appearing in the heavens and everywhere. Have you heard about it? Angels everywhere. What do backsliders who once knew the power of God think when the worst sinners and liberals are talking about angels? What what do they say now when the scientists watching television and now they say all these weather changes, there's something cataclysmic, there's something supernatural going on, and many scientists say we're destroying our planet, it's soon going to be all over. 
And that Christian in the back slid in there says, I know what that's all about. That's, that's John. He's raising the dead. I've been, that's a gospel. <laughs> the Holy Ghost is the hound of heaven. He'll hound you because he loves you. He'll hound you. Oh, boy, does he hound. I'm thanking, I'm glad he, he hounded me. He'll hound you till your last moment. He'll stay right with you. I don't care who it is. The Holy Ghost, the hound of heaven will stay right there. Finally, Herod types end up mocking and laughing at very God himself. Because Jesus was God in flesh. Would you go to Luke 23 with me, please? We're going to see him coming face to face, finally, with his nightmare. Can you imagine this man living three years with this uh, nightmare, this haunting? 23rd chapter, verse 3, beginning to read. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And when they were... And they, and they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod. Isn't that amazing? After about three years now, Herod's finally going to meet him face to face, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus... He was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Now look this way, please. I know exactly how that went. Jesus walks in, and Herod's looking at him, looks him over, and he's thinking, his eyes aren't the same. He's a little taller. And he speaks with a different voice. But that's John. That's John. And you know what he said? Come on now, I know they call you Jesus, but you're John, aren't you? You're John. Tell me you're John. This man's still haunted. You're John the Baptist. You've been raised from the dead. What do you want out of me? I can't sleep. I can't eat. What do you want? There's not a sound. This, this man says, I know exactly who you are. You are John the Baptist. I cut off your head and I'm thinking he's looking for a scar. I believe he got as close as he could to walk around him and see if there was any mark for the sword. He chopped off his head. You know what the Bible says? Here's the tragedy of the hard heart. And Jesus answered him, not a word. There's no greater judgment than for God to stop talking to you. There's no greater judgment on earth. Saul knew what that was all about. He came under that judgment because he followed the sin of his own heart. His pride took him away from the repentance. The scripture said, when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. He finally ends up trying to consult with the witch. You know what he tells this witch? He said, God has departed from me, and he answers me no more, neither by prophets, nor by dreams. He said, I don't hear from God anymore. I can't think of anything more tragic, it causes me to tremble that a person can become so hard in their heart and the Lord sees that nothing is going to move it, that he doesn't talk anymore. And it ends up that you can sit in a meeting like this, no movement of the Holy Ghost, no amount of conviction, 
if an angel came down in bodily form and preached directly from the throne of God, it would not touch. No tragedy can move the heart. There's nothing. The heart is absolutely untouchable. In fact, every question to God, every inquiry now is met by an emptiness. There's no answer. There's no response. Oh, my brother, sister, that is one thing. I would rather be dead now than that that should ever happen to me because, oh, if I did not have the comfort of the Holy Spirit inside that voice, that inner voice of the Holy Ghost, you're my beloved son, I love you, and to get his direction and to know the, 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 the witness of the Holy Spirit that the Christian has. Christian, if you didn't have the witness of the Holy Ghost, you would be in terror. If you didn't have the voice, you hear him. You, you heard him today. You're hearing him now while I preach. The majority of you who love the Lord, you're hearing him in the inner man right now. It's not my preaching that's comforts you. It's the Holy Ghost in you that's comforting you. You hear his voice. You know his mind. He speaks to you. He convicts you of sin, of judgment and righteousness. He's in you. He's at work. God help those who backslide, those who follow their idols, and they can sit in any church, any kind of revival meeting, any kind of moving of the Holy Spirit. No conviction. Absolutely, totally dead. Jesus, see, he answers Pilate. Pilate's not quite hard-hearted, I guess. The Herod, who had once received him gladly. And you know what happens next? The man who received Jesus gladly, in mockery, puts a royal robe on his back. And he starts laughing at him. He said, King of the Jews. And he begins to laugh at him. And he joins the soldiers in mocking this blessed Lord. And the chief priest and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught. Means they began to belittle him and they mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. And that's something that you can one time have heard the gospel with gladness and then up end up sitting in the church snickering at the preaching. You can end up sitting there. What a bunch of crazies. What a foolish thing to think that at one time I believed that garbage. What a bunch of unintelligent people. Let's get out of here and end up mocking the Son of God. And folks, I tell you, the greatest mockers of the cross of Jesus Christ are those who, like Herod, at one time, gladly received the gospel. And they become mockers and scoffers. In closing, I have a dear friend who had to endure a horrible tragedy just recently. His father, in the 80s, a stepmother dying of cancer. <clears throat> and they called in one of these suicide doctors for a double suicide. And uh, in fact, they even called the newspapers came in on it. It was rather well publicized. And this dear man dear friend of mine, had to listen to his father when he begged him one last time, please, please. He'd witness to him and witness to him. Just before the man's about to go into eternity through an assisted suicide with a lethal injection, turns to his son and says, get away with your garbage. I don't want to hear of your Jesus. I don't want to hear anything of that. That's for money-grubbing preachers. The words to that effect, I want nothing to do with it. Hard. Broke his son's heart. This broke him. This man and his wife 
What an eternity. Hard. Like a rock. How are you going to go out? How are you going to face Jesus at the judgment day? You think that hardness is going to stand before the throne? You think that hardness is going to stand? No, because that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and every eye shall behold him. Where are you at? In what stage are you in this process of hardening? Is there still time? Let me tell you when you could know if there's time. If you sense a stirring in your heart right now, there's something still moving. That's the Holy Spirit. He's still able to penetrate. He's penetrated those walls that you're already erecting. He, maybe he came in through a window, came in through a door that's cracked. The Holy Spirit's there. He's witnessing to you. He's saying, don't turn me away. That's why he stands at the door and knocks because he knows somebody's about to harden and shut him out forever. Some of you are that close to closing him up that he never can speak to you again. Not that he doesn't want to. Not that his voice is not heard around the world. You'll sit in meetings where Many, many, many are being saved, but you'll be unmoved. Oh, Jesus, what an awful, horrible thing to imagine that some that are here tonight hearing me preach this message in the process of being hardened in their hearts could still walk out and say, I can't give up my sin. I can't give up this thing in my heart, I won't give it up. And then go out and have happen just good things that keep people out of heaven. Good things that keep people out of heaven. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your manifest presence here this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. Holy Spirit, thank you for manifesting Christ into our hearts and our minds. We thank you, Lord. This has been a good week because of your presence. Lord, it's always good when you're with us. You said you'd never leave us, you'll never forsake us. Now, Lord, I've got a serious uh, word to bring forth this morning, a very serious word. Lord, there are many people here, uh, there, there are so many here, that unless they hear this, will not even be saved. Oh, God, stir us by your Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, come down now. Take the word that you planted in my heart and let it find root. Let it find fruit in the hearts and lives of these who hear it. Father, anoint me, sanctify me. Give me clean hands and a pure heart that I may preach your word, O God, with nothing hindering. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit be upon me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Good things that keep people out of heaven. Now, believe it or not, there are many people engrossed in doing wonderful, good things who are not going to make heaven. Worse yet, there are many who consider themselves Christians who are convinced they're on the way to heaven are not going to go to heaven even though they're not involved in a lot of bad things. Now that seems like a paradox, but you'll see what I mean as it unfolds in the truth of this morning. I'm referring to those who probably have never or do not use drugs or alcohol. They're not involved or indulging in pornography or gambling or perversion. They're not numbered among the wicked or the vile. In fact, you probably find most of these people are referred to in church on Sunday morning, anywhere in the country. You'll find them as family people, family values. You'll see them with friends. You'll see them enjoying the good things of life. But having said that, let me make a very bold statement, and some of you may be offended by it. But I want to make it here before I start, and I want you to listen very closely. I say it out of loving concern for the body of Jesus Christ. Some of you who are convinced you're going to heaven are going to be shut out, and you may be in danger of losing your soul. Even though you sit in this church this morning absolutely convinced that you are on your way to heaven. 
if you've ever listened to a message in your life, listen to what the Holy Spirit says this morning. Very, very vital to your very salvation. Some are going to be shut out, not because of the bad things they've done, but because they've become so preoccupied with doing good, legitimate things, they have pushed the things of God aside. So involved in doing good, legitimate things, that they have literally had no time for the deeper spiritual things of the Spirit. They're so interested in the here and now, they have pushed out of their mind the hereafter. They're not knowingly rejecting the Lord, but they've simply neglected. It's not adultery, it's not fornication, it's none of these things that we totem pole as, as vile, gross sins. They're honest, sincere, hard-working people, but their focus has been damaged. Their focus is completely out of order. The Word says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, these are the words of Jesus, and they're not a suggestion. They're a commandment. The Lord means what He says. You seek first the kingdom of God, I'll take care of your career, I'll take care of your business, I'll take care of your home life, I'll take care of everything if you will put me first in your focus. The Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Again, that's not a suggestion, that's a commandment. Set your affections like iron, like concrete, set your affections on the things of God. And in the Greek it says, it means set your focus or your interest on the things of the Lord, things above. Set it. Immovable. Intractable. You cannot change because you have set it in concrete. Now, God has never demanded that anyone who follows Him now, to sell their houses, their land, their business, and become a monk and go meditate and study the Bible all day. God never said that. He said that to one man, and he said that to one man because that was his idol. He does not say it to everybody. He's not telling you to forsake your family. He's not telling. We have many people come, married people, many wives come and say, God told me to leave my wife, my, hu my husband, my children, to go into the ministry. And I look him right in, I say, no, God didn't tell you that. Your own mind told you that, or the devil. God's not in the business of breaking up marriages. No, God's not asking you to, to, to go out and do something uh, like that at all. But God does insist, in fact, He demands in being the center of your life around which everything else revolves. He alone has to be the center of everything you say and everything you do. Everything else has to revolve around that interest. It has to be central. The greatest indignity against the Lord is for Christians to put Him in a secondary place. To slap in God's face. You say you're not guilty of that kind of an affront to the Lord. Then how do you prior prioritize your time? What takes the priority? What about all the nights you've missed going to church? Because you put your job, your business, your career first. No, your clients didn't wait. God waited. Now, I'm not talking about people, nurses and, and uh, day jobs where, where your job requires that you work doing a church night service. No, because you have no choice. I'm talking about those who have a choice. Those in career and those in business and those who have jobs where they have a choice and we're not out working in the hours when God's people meet. The Bible said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as some are doing in the last days. Don't forsake yourself, the, the assembling of the saints. That's the commandment of the Lord. But what takes priority? Your business? Your job? Your career? Who does the waiting? Is it God who's waiting in the assembly to meet with you? And the, what the scripture is actually saying to you, if, if you would put my house, my interest first, I'll take care of all of that. And that which you thought had to be done now can be done at a later date, at a better time, and God would make it successful. God would take care of it. Now let me take you into God's Word and show you the awful consequences 
of being so preoccupied with good, legitimate things that the things of God, the interest of the Lord, the eternal purposes of God are put secondary. They are not the priority of the life. And let me show you the awful consequences. In fact, I didn't know the Lord had said so much about it in His Word. And when I saw it, I thought, we had better listen. And I'm hearing it. I hear it in my spirit, and I want you to hear it this morning. Let's consider, first of all, what Jesus said about the days of Noah and Lot. I want you to go to Luke 17, please. Now, folks, it's going to get very hot here in just a few moments. I hope you love the Word. Luke 17. Let's begin reading verse 26. Luke 17, beginning to read verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. The same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven that destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. Let's stop right there. Now, folks, I want you to look again at this list that Jesus, these are red letters and these are the words of Jesus himself. I want you to look at the list of the things they were doing both in the time of Noah and in Sodom and Gomorrah. What were they doing? We know there were, these were times of violence violence such as the world had never seen. There was gross immorality, but the Lord is not talking about homosexuality here. He's not talking about alcoholism. He's not talking about perversion. He's not talking about abortions. What does he say that they were doing? They did eat. They drank. That's not talking about drunkenness. They were just eating and drinking liquids. They married. They were being espoused or engaged. They bought. They sold. They planted. They built it. There's not a sin on that list. These are all good things. These are all things that God considers uh, a faithful, righteous person would do if they're going to be providers for their family. All of these things are recommended in the Scripture to those who are faithful to their families and to God. Those who are legitimately uh, people who are working, uh, individuals. Paul said marriage is no sin. God said marriage is honorable. In Proverbs 31, it says that a virtuous wife considers a field, she buys it, she plants a vineyard, she works diligently with her hands. And as far as building is concerned, ever since the time of Joshua, when they went into the pro promised land, God moved on men to build many, many edifices and buildings for his glory. There's nothing wrong with anything that's mentioned. These are good things. These are legitimate things. Why did Jesus focus on the good, legitimate things they did in that day, both in Noah's day and Sodom's day? Folks, he's trying to say something to us. It was their total inattention to his word while being so absorbed in their own selfish interest. There's not a word said that Noah, in his 120 years of building the ark, was ever abused. There's not a word there that even he was mocked. There's not a word there that anyone stopped him in the construction of that ark. He, he worked unabated. No one bothered him the whole time that he's in construction of the... Of the he, he was able to preach. No one stopped his message. But you see, in Noah's day, everybody was so busy marrying getting engaged, going to uh, eating places, and mixing with their friends, and having pleasure, and so involved in life, they had no time for Noah's message. That's what the Lord is saying. They were so wrapped up in good, legitimate things. Boy, you talk about pinning the American lifestyle. It's not that, you know, I can go anywhere in the United States, I can write books and I can prophesy about the coming of the Lord and coming judgments. But, you know, outside of a few in the remnant who accept it and believe that the masses here, they don't listen, they don't care. Why? Because they, 
they are busy. They've got plans. They're doing things. They're all wrapped up in their marriages and in their homes and in their businesses and making money. They have no time for any message of the coming judgment of the Lord. Noah's message got lost in a hustle of busyness. So shall it be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. And the Lord is saying in the last generation is going to be the same way. They're going to be so busy, so wrapped up in their families, so wrapped up in their jobs and their careers, they are going to put my message, my interest aside. John 2, 31, 32. Wherefore, say my people, we will come to you no more. My people have forgotten me days without number, yet they say, I am innocent. Behold, I will plead with thee, because you say, I have not sinned. And folks, that's the way it is now. There are many who think they're on the way to heaven, convinced they are. They don't open their Bible week after week. The Bible lays on the shelf. The only word they get is in the house of God. They're not seeking the face of God diligently. They're not locked in some little room. They're not locked in a bedroom. They're not, when everybody's gone, they don't prioritize, they prioritize their time and say, Lord, I'm going to give you time. They're not seekers after God. They're good people. They're moral people. They're family people with family values, doing good things, legitimate things. But the Lord is not first. The Lord is not everything. He's not the center of their life. If He were the center of their, if your life, if He is the center of your life, you will find time with Him. You will love His Word. He will be everything to you. He'll not put Him aside. He'll not take second place. The prophet chided them in this, in Jeremiah, for gadding about. You'll find that Jeremiah 2, 3. He said, my people gad about, running around, doing good things, busy doing legitimate works, even religious things, but n neglecting the Word of God, not time to seek God. You know, you can be so busy running around for God, you can't seek Him. You can't sit and listen, because you're running, 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 gadding about. There are some churches that keep their busy, their people so preoccupied, so busy. I've heard people in certain churches tell me, Brother Dave, I have no time with my family. I have no time to pray, no time to seek God. We promised God we'd never do that in this church. Keep you running so much that you had no time to spend with Him or your family. So shall it be when the Son of Man comes. He said, that's the way it's going to be. He, and why, why isn't he say, when, when I come, why didn't he talk about our crime rate? Why didn't he talk about abortion? Why didn't he talk about uh, pushing him out of our schools? Why didn't he talk about the gross immorality of America and the violence? Why didn't he say, he said, it's going to be just like it was eating, selling, buying, planting, busy. He didn't even name any of our sins. He named only the good, legitimate things. There are a number of people that used to attend this church. I, in my mind, I see their faces. I know their names. This, this church is going to celebrate, I think it, it's, uh, and, and we begin our ninth year, isn't it, in September or October? And this is probably the first three years. There was such an excitement. There were people, business people, a lot of career people, and those who hold day jobs. Just ordinary loving people, and they were so excited, they never missed a service. They would not only sit and listen, they would buy every tape and go home and listen to it again so they'd get it. They would, they, every time they went out, they went out loaded down with tapes and were passing them everywhere. They told us time and time again, they would put their arms around me and say, Brother Dave, I was starving, and this church has saved my life. And they were so excited about Jesus, they never missed. They were on fire. The church of Jesus Christ came first, the things of God first. They were praying. They were seeking God. They are not here. They are gone. 
It used to be when I would see them on the street or I would go into their business, they would call me. You should have seen, I would walk in, the secretary, I said, I'm, I'm Pastor Wilkes. Oh, go right in. And I would go in, they would drop everything and hug me and say, Pastor, Sunday was marvelous. Oh, I went home and I could hardly sleep. The Spirit of the Lord was upon me all night. They would see me on the street, they would come running and hug me, and even turn around to strangers with a big beam. This is my pastor, we're from Thomas Park Church, you need to come. They were wrapped up in their business. Little by little I saw them backslide. They're no longer here. Oh, they still love the Lord, they, they pray at times, but they're going to a church now, they get a one hour service and a twenty little minute message with no conviction. And when I see them on the street now, they pretend they don't see me and run. And I want you to know that hurts. I feel the rejection. What do you think God feels? What do you think God feels? By those who once knew Him and walked with Him and cried with Him. And now they're all wrapped up. They said, Lord, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. You've saved my life from a godless hell. And the very fact that they don't want to talk to me anymore is proof they're not talking to God anymore. And he is before all things, speaking of Jesus, he's the head of the body, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And that preeminence is another word for first place. Now let's consider the man who made a great feast, whose invited guest turned him down. Go to Luke 14, just turn left. Luke 14. Now this parable is very important because Jesus gave it, and more than that, he's the man who gave the feast. This is all about Jesus. 14, verse 16, beginning to read. Then he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. He invited many. And sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray they have me excused. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray they have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So that servant came, showed his lord these things, and the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. The servant said, Lord, it's done as thou hast commanded, and yet there's room. The Lord said unto the servant, Go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now folks, this is serious, serious business. That feast is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that table was spread at the cross. That's the invitation of Jesus himself said, come on to me. It's an invitation to intimacy. It's an intimate invitation for all of us. It's not just for few. He, he bade many. He invited you to come. The table is spread. You can come and find full satisfaction in me. You can find everything you need to satisfy any hunger in your life. All things having to do with holiness and godliness, all wrapped up in Christ Jesus feasting on him in his presence, we supping with him, he's supping with us. That's the invitation, that's the feast. And at supper time, everything was ready, and those who were invited didn't show up. There was nobody there, the table was spread, and nobody had showed up, and nobody was coming down the road. Sister, how would you feel? You, you cook this wonderful meal, you've invited guests, they said they would come. It's a seven o'clock meal, and you, you decided to set the table, and you have everything on the stove just on simmer, and nobody shows up. And then you send somebody out, or you get on the phone and call and say, where are you? 
Well, well, I'm sorry. They didn't even call you, didn't give you any notice, but they just don't come. Wouldn't you take that as total rejection? Wouldn't you take that as being not interested in anything you do? Not interested in your feast? Not interested whatsoever? I want you to look at this. This is, this is the Lord's invitation. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He said, all things are now ready. Do you understand, folks, that Jesus has done everything already? He doesn't have to do anything else to give us full satisfaction in this life. He doesn't have to add anything. It's all there. The table's been spread. Everything's been ready. According as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. They all, with one consent, began to make excuse. Now, the first excuse excused himself because he was preoccupied with a real estate deal. He said, I have bought a piece of ground, and I have to go and see it. Please excuse me. Now, he had to be a speculator. Only a speculator would buy land without seeing it. It could have been swamp land. And by the way, that land wasn't going anywhere. He didn't have to go right then. He could have gone tomorrow. But you see, he's so wrapped up. Now, he could have been a builder, a place to build some buildings. I don't know. It may have been a plot of land to build a house for his family. I don't know. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. The point is, it's a good, legitimate thing. The excuse is not sinful. If you bought land today and Jesus comes tonight, you didn't sin. He said, occupy till I come. That's not the point. The point is that this man had the wrong focus. He focused on his land, he focused on his business, he focused on building and buying. He, he put the invitation for intimacy with the Lord aside. He says, I'll take care of that later, I'm going to take care of my business first. You take care of your business first and I want to tell you something. The Bible says the master was angry. And he said, that man is not coming. He will never enter my doors. He's not going in. Now, folks, that's serious business. Just before judgment fell on Judah, remember Elijah bought a piece of land from one of his relatives. So I'm telling you, that's not the sin. The second one speculated in cattle. He said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them or test them. Now, I don't know if he bought them at an auction. That's a lot of cattle. That's, that's ten, ten ox. And he buys them. He probably saw them. They look good, but now he's going to go prove them. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, Job and Abraham could probably tell him a lot about oxen. They were rich in cattle. That's not a sin. Folks, I hope you're getting the point. Everywhere God speaks about when he comes, what it's going to be like when he comes. He's saying these people are doing good, legitimate things, but it's taking their mind, it's consuming them. And they're putting me aside. They're excusing themselves. Is it to say, well, I still love him? That's okay. He understands. I've got a, I've got a family to feed. I've got things to do. No. God will not, under any circumstances, take second place. He won't. He said, I'm telling you, I love you, and if you put me first, if, if my work comes first, I'll take care of these things. You'll not go down. You'll not go under. Mm. Isn't it strange that some people find it more important to go to the barn than to go to the house of God. That's what he did. He went to the barn. Test his oxen. The last one says, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. Now nothing could be more legitimate than getting married. That's a good thing. In fact, marriage is honorable, the Bible says. Honorable. He that finds a good wife finds a good thing, the scripture says. It's a good thing. You see, that's not the issue. The Lord 
It says everything they do is fine in its time and its place. But not in my place. Not in my place. And that's the sin. You see, he, he should have told his wife. He should have started his marriage on the right foot. He should have said, now dear, I'll tell you something. The Lord has always been first in my life. Nothing takes the place of my Lord. I go to church. I, I seek the face of God. And when those doors are open, honey, I'm going to be there. And I want... I want my values to be your values. I want you to walk with me. He should have taken her. She'd have had a great time. What woman doesn't have a good time to get dressed up and go to a feast? But you see, he put family first. This is one of the great sins in the church today. I, I see housewives who... Who, who find it hard to come to church on Sunday morning, let alone any other night. But they have time to get about all day for their kids, music classes, dancing classes, all kinds of classes, picnics, sports, shopping. Our folks, the list could go on and on and on. My kids come first. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm subconscious about it now. <laughs> Put your children first, and you're going to damn them. That's what happened to Hezekiah. He got 15 extra years that should have been spent on his face before God and renewing the land, and he spent his last 15 years playing with adult toys, with jewels and cattle, and building buildings. And he raised a son during the time named Manasseh, who watched his dad put him and his toys first, and he became one of the most wicked kings in the history of Israel. Who's first in your life? Your family? Do you let your husband or your wife dictate how you're going to follow the Lord? Do you stay away from God's house because your wife or your husband says, stay home with me tonight? Let me make another strong statement, and I want you to hear this. If you don't get anything else out of my message, hear this clear. You are not truly a lover of Jesus if you're not protective of your time spent with him. It has to come to the place where everything else is considered an intrusion into your time. If you, if you don't have a certain time given to the Lord, if you don't have that special time and you protect that time and you will not let anybody anything intrude folks I hope I'm at that place where when I go into the prayer closet I tell my family I don't care who calls if the president called I'm busy a chance of his calling me By the way, I'd sooner get a call from any of you. Not that I don't pray for the president. I pray every day. But see, once you put off the Lord, once you put other things in his place, it gets easier and easier to put him off. Till finally, you neglect him, as the scripture said, days without number. Jesus said, I say unto you that none of these men which were invited shall taste of my supper. He said, all right, so gentlemen, you're so busy. You push me aside. I'm no longer first in your life. You put your family and your donkeys and your oxen and, and your lands and possessions ahead of me. You don't want to come and sup with me and get to know me. Then I'm telling you, you're not going to enter my gates. 
There are going to be many say, we did mighty works, we cast out devils, we healed the sick. Mighty good, those are all good things, but it damned, they were still damned in the end. All these good things that they did. Because Lord said, I don't know you. I don't know you. Finally, a large number who ought to be in the bridal procession are going to be left out. They're not going to be in the bridal procession in the last day. Now, it's a powerful parable given to us in Matthew 25. Will you turn left again to Matthew 25, quickly? This is about the virgins, the ten virgins. You know this quite well. I'm going to be finished here in ten minutes, but I want you to get this. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. When the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. All those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, our lamps are gone out. The wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. Go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I send you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Now look at me, please. Folks, this is very powerful since the bridal party represents the church. I don't know if Bible statistics are true. Could it be that half of those who think they're in the bridehood of Christ are not going to make it? This is an awful, awful picture here. And by the way, folks, I have no trouble with them slumbering, sleeping up to midnight. First place, that's not the heart of the story. In second place, and listen closely, the, the, those who had oil, they could sleep in peace because because they had enough to see them through to the morning. They had what it takes. But folks, we get so focused on the oil, we don't see something I want to show you here. Very important. We know that their lamps went out because of a lack of oil. Some people call that the Holy Spirit, that, that they have lost the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They have been walking carelessly. All of that, that may be. But once they did replenish the oil, the five wise virgins are already in. The bride, bridal party is already in and the doors are closed. They go get their supply of oil and they come back. The five foolish virgins are knocking at the door. Lord, Lord, open to us. What did the bridegroom say? He didn't ask, where have you been? He didn't say, you didn't... He didn't miss any of their sins. He didn't talk about their being late. He didn't say anything like that. What did he say? He said, I don't know you. I don't know you. That's the heart of this story. I had a... Last Sunday, I had a lady and her daughter backstage. And they stood there smiling at me, shook hands, and just stood there smiling. They said, you don't recognize us? I said, no. We met you 15 years ago in, in Los Angeles at a crusade. You prayed for us. We're on your manning list. We love your messages. We pray for you every day. Don't you recognize us? I said, I'm sorry. I don't. I haven't seen you in 15 years. You see the disappointment on their face. I get that all the time. Almost once or twice a month, somebody comes from around the country. I babysat with you when your parents went on vacation. I haven't seen them in years. Now, we know God's omniscient. He knows everything. It's not a fact that he doesn't know them. You know what the Lord is saying? You've never taken me serious. You never put me first. That's not what my bridehood's about. I can't recognize that spirit. I can't recognize your kind of walk. That's not what this is about. I'm sorry. You're not a part of this. 
You're part of another world. I don't recognize that. I won't accept that. Is exactly what it is. I won't accept that. Folks, I don't want to stand on that day. I don't want to stand on that day as a stranger. Do you know him in a secret closet? Not here in church and worship. Do you know him in a secret closet? Is is when 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 you're sitting uh, on the subway going to work? Do you shut yourself in? And are you knowing him? Are you talking to him? When the house of God is open, are you here as often as you can, other than being too sick to come? And then ask God to heal you, and He'll give you the power to come anyhow. You, you say, are you trying to pack the church? Folks, this church couldn't be any more packed. Look, people standing everywhere. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with your eternal salvation and putting the things of God first. Now, folks, I'm going to close in just a minute. But I'm going to tell you, you know, you take a walk in the streets of New York at night. And it's a heartbreaking experience. Like last night for me. Just to go out to get a newspaper. It's only two blocks. And on 49th Street, a bag woman sitting in a door stoop. She couldn't be more than in her mid-50s. But she looks like she's in her 80s or 90s. And she's got her little bag. And I look at her, her, her eyes met mine. It was that lost look as if to say, this is all that life has offered me. And I'm thinking, that was, that's somebody's mother. That's somebody's mother. And your gut turns. And then you go to 8th Avenue and turn right, and you see a man in his early 30s probably, but he looks like he's in his 60s, and he's on drugs, and he's stoned. And he's muttering some foolishness that he doesn't understand or anybody else understands. And you say, oh God, he lives in hell. He's going to die and go to a fiery hell. I said, that doesn't seem right to me that somebody lives in hell and then dies and goes to hell. And then you put it by a newspaper and while you're turning around, you see a young prostitute and her eyes meet yours and you see a lostness and you wonder in your heart, has she ever known what it's like to be normal? You see her diseased body broken and still trying to sell it to get another fix. And you start crying and you walk into your apartment and close the door and go into the study and sit on your chair and just stare in space and say, oh God, didn't you say that Chorazin and Bethsaida would have more mercy than Sodom and Gomorrah? Because in Sodom they didn't hear, they didn't have a Bible, they didn't have the Word. And I think of all of these people on the streets, all these derelicts, and I say, God, they've not heard the sermons that the people hear at Times Square Church. They don't know how, even if they heard it, they don't know how to process it. Their minds are shut. But, oh God, I think sometimes in my heart you're going to have more mercy. You're going to have more compassion on all the derelicts and the homeless alcoholics that walk this street without a brain left. And all the saints of God who have heard hundreds and hundreds of sermons and turned their back, gone their way, backslidden in heart, putting the Lord off. Amen. Where is he in your life? I'm telling you now, if he's not the apple of your eye, if you're not focused on him, that includes his church, his word, prayer, his interest. 
you can't be his disciple. Better to be a derelict than a hypocrite. Let me tell you why I preach like this. Because I know how soon I have to be before him. Just my age. And listen to me. I, I'm going to answer to God not for being one of his instruments to raise up this church and be a testimony to New York City. I have to answer for you. Everyone who calls this your home, I have to answer to God. God help me if I didn't deliver you the whole counsel of God. And even to prick you even to bring the hammer down and crush your self-interest and bring you back to where you belong. I'm going to say it again, straight and clear. And I say it out of love. A number of you that are hearing this message now, unless you make a commitment now, Lord, from this morning on, I commit to you that you are going to be the center and everything else is going to take second place. Your church, your interest, your word, my family, everything. Second place. You're everything, Jesus, from this day on. And if not, if not, everything else is in vain. Will you stand? Heavenly Father, only you know the hearts of those I minister to today. The balcony, the main floor, those who are standing, those in the lower rotunda, and those backstage, all around, wherever they may be in this house. Lord Jesus, I've delivered my soul. And now, Lord, it's up to you, Holy Spirit. It's up to you, Holy Spirit, to make this word life. Oh, God. Don't let anybody that calls themselves your friend, your child, ever to reject you and put you pigeonholed somewhere secondary. God, bring us back. Bring us to this place. I'm placing you first. Now, here's my invitation. First of all, for those in this building, you have to admit, Pastor David, I tell you the truth. I've been so busy. I've grown cold. I've really grown cold in my spirit. I want you to come first. Maybe you don't even know Jesus. Come with these that are coming. You may not even know him. Come now. From the balcony, you go to the stairs on either end, on either side, and come down any aisle. Now, be honest before the Lord. Pastor David, folks, this is serious business before the Holy Ghost. I've been so busy. I've been so wrapped. I've not taken the time to seek God. I've not taken time with His Word. I've been convicted by the Holy Spirit this morning. The Holy Ghost is convicted. You come. This is the first invitation. That's it. Second invitation is not for the, for those who are going to get in an hour, come down. There's no room. But when you're right where you stand in your seat, if you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit and there's been that sharp knife, that's God speaking. That's God saying, this is for you. Apply it now. Change. Make the change. You that have come forward, look at me, please. I want to tell you something. As, as just as strong as he is in his warnings, so loving as he 
when you receive it. He's not going to, he doesn't go and say, uh, rebuke and say, now, uh, why did you do it? And where did you go? And why did you get so cold toward me? And why did you drift? No questions. He's saying, the table is spread, now come. Come back where you left. Come to the point of departure and renew now. This is a time for renewal, right now. Listen to me, please. It's not that God wants a river of tears from you. He doesn't want any promises from you. What He wants is you to promise yourself. You've got to make a commitment for yourself. You've got to give Him a mind now and say, I am going to commit right now. God, help me by your Holy Spirit to keep this commitment. Because you can't do it in yourself. We all have a tendency to slip back into our lazy ways. That's why even as a minister of the gospel, I have to stay close to him and in this word, in this word. But folks, you that are standing here now, God wants to do something very special for you. He wants to nail this thing down. He wants to nail it down. You wouldn't have come forward unless the Spirit of God was on you. You wouldn't have come forward unless something in your heart says, this is what I want. I want the Lord Jesus from now till I die, or till Jesus comes, to be the center of my life and my home. How many want that? Raise your hand, please. Keep it raised there for just a moment. And pray with me this prayer right now. Jesus, forgive me for being self-centered. I'm sorry. I don't want it that way. I want you to be everything. I make a commitment to you, Lord. By your grace and mercy, and by the help of the Holy Spirit, from this day on, to keep you first in my life. Help my focus, Lord. Keep it on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, will you thank him in your own words, Lord? I thank you for dealing with me this morning, for calling me back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, look at me. What a wonderful thing when you just come with a willing, open heart and say, Lord, that's me. I'm, that's me. I'm sorry. The Lord sees that. And oh, he'll move quickly. You know what happened? Then, then the Holy Spirit will bring this word back to your mind and replay it. And he'll keep loving you, keep convicting you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He convicts us of sin. But you've got to make up your mind right now. See, you've, you've got to stay in this book. Have the time. Have a place. Let me tell you, if you have a quiet time with the Lord every day, even when you get up or before you go to bed, sometime in the day, you've got to have a half hour at least there where it's just you and the Lord alone and you're talking heart to heart with Him and then into His Word. Go through the Psalms. Have that. I'm going to tell you, you're not going to, you're not going to put Him aside. You will not put him away. He will, he will be there. That's why it's good to start today that way. And say, when you get up in the morning, first thing you say, Lord, I'm focused on you. You're my Lord. And help me today to put you first in everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. First, Lord, in everything. Now, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing by your spirit in this congregation. All through this house. Lord, you've convicted me in my preaching. I hope you've convicted every one of us. Lord, that we would, we would never, ever have time for everything, but not time for you. God, it doesn't mean we're going to put aside these good things. These are good things, legitimate things. We need to continue providing for our families and building and planting and selling. Those are good things, Lord Jesus. But Lord, help us to put them in their place. Nothing before you from this day on. Nothing before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. These five people say, God is good. God is good. He is. He's good. God is good. God is good. 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 Good.
I miss my